Chapter 7. Self-Discovery Self-discovery is self-inquiry. It's a deep inner questioning to find out who you really are by looking at who you are not. It's not enough to say that God is within me, the truth flows through me, the spark of God lives in me, or a hundred other affirmations or mantras the false self utters. This gives attention to the belief that the God you are is separate from you, but somehow connected, not one as you. However, mantras and affirmations that declare the truth of who you really are, such as I am that I am, have enormous power when spoken with genuine humility and the resolute choice to be free no matter what. Surrender of the false self cannot be faked. The God you really are cannot be fooled with insincere haggling for favors to make your separate life more comfortable. You must come naked, authentic, and transparent to the altar of your true self before the shackles of conditioning can be exposed for transformation. Self-discovery will bring up a great deal of buried anger and rage, and it's been poisoning and controlling your every thought, word, and deed for eons. It will strip you of your masks and obliterate your illusions until you are totally naked and empty, and in that emptiness the truth will enter in all its glory and splendor to show you beyond any doubt whatsoever that you are God. Self-discovery is ruthless. Nothing may remain in hiding. None of your coveted, tasty, cherished attachments may be retained. No expectation or hope for outcome may be held as sacred. And absolutely no identity that places you outside who you really are may be held back, just in case you one day may need it if God lets you down. Again. Yes, again. The false self believes that God has betrayed it let it down in a thousand ways, abandon it, and will continue to do so for as long as it lives. It must hold something back just in case it needs to run and hide or continue to fend for itself. The rug could be pulled out from beneath its feet at any moment, so it must be vigilant, always looking over its shoulder for any sign of subterfuge or sabotage. As you come nearer and nearer absolute freedom, the false self will act out scenes of horror and terror and viciousness on the screen of consciousness to pull you out of the freedom you have become as a witness to its dreams in the audience. The false self is quiet, or at least subtle, until the stage of dreams is nearly empty, and it stands naked before you as the specter of nothingness that it is. When this occurs, and its reign of terror, as the tyrant and jailer it has been, is nearly at an end, it will not hide, but seek to expose your worst fears and nightmares in an attempt to keep you in prison behind the walls of illusion. Self-discovery, satsang, is standing in the fire of who you are not until the flames burn away everything that is not real. It is not for the timid who still prefer to live in a Hollywood spirituality that seeks to make the false self's dream as comfortable as possible. No, the false self must be uncomfortable in order to shake loose the grasp it holds on your freedom. No matter what. You must have reached the point of no return when you can no longer endure the loneliness and sorrow, frustrations and constant fear in order to reap the meager fruits of the dream world your false self calls reality. You must have come to the edge of the cliff, no matter what your circumstances, attachments, so-called responsibilities and sacred identities are, and be willing to chuck it all for the sake of your freedom. Jesus said, sell all you have and follow me. This doesn't mean that you'll have to let everything go. It means you must be willing to let everything go if it comes to that. No exceptions. In most cases, in this new energy, it will not be required to physically let go of everything and stand penniless and nearly naked, as I was after I made the jump off the self-discovery cliff. The speed with which transformation occurs now is so fast, and from one moment to the next you may find that you have stepped over the threshold of dreams and into the audience as a witness to the actor you have been, and still are, on the stage of illusions still tethered to the actor but free, knowing that what you're watching is not real, not who you really are. Your longing to return home to truth must be insatiable, and when it is, your no matter what commitment to your freedom will sustain you in the fire of who you are not. Energy follows attention. I have spoken about how important what we give our attention to is. No matter what we give our attention to, energy flows into the mold immediately. You have no doubt heard the old cliché, be careful what you wish for. This is literally true. 
since focused attention on anything will eventually bring it into your experience. The catch is, and the reason for the warning, is that all your conditioning poisons what eventually manifests. You could say that your attention is filtered through these forgotten and hidden gremlins waiting to show up in what the world often calls your dreams. By dreams I mean the temporary existence of the dreams or burning desires or manifestations that you choose to experience. Once again, let me be perfectly clear. You as God chose to live in this world of dreams in order to know yourself, in order to play, and for a while in total unawareness of who you are. It's not a mistake. The field of dreams has been your playground, and in ignorance of your true and only identity as God, you've been able to experience the deepest darkness possible. Now in the new energy of total awareness of who you are, you will consciously experience this field of dreams in the light of the highest truth. As I said, the pendulum swings an equal distance from one side of nothingness to the other. Most of humanity's attention is placed on temporary things and experiences, and in most cases intermittently, meaning not in a consistent enough way to bring what they have been focused on into manifestation. If that had not been the case, just imagine how many disastrous things would have appeared. In both of the movie series Pirates of the Caribbean and Narnia, the characters experience the instant manifestation of their fearful thoughts appearing as monsters. In the same way, if the three-dimensional world humanity has lived within had not been so slow, that is to manifest casual intentions, it would have destroyed the world long ago. This is not the case in the new energy, which is so much faster. And this is why the fears that people still cling to in the imbalanced patriarchy are manifesting as chaos everywhere. From finance to politics to education to war to the media, imbalance is being exposed everywhere and falling like the house of cards it is. The revealing power, accessibility, and transparency of our communication system is no accident. It's one of the instruments of transformation the new energy is using to lift global conscious awareness of the truth in part by exposing what the truth is not. The beginning of self-discovery. Discovering who you are not is the simplest way to reveal the truth of who you really are. There are endless descriptions of what truth is, what reality is, what love is, who God is, and numberless otherworldly states of experience, but none touch the essence of the God you are because you cannot place a frame around infinity. Words immediately limit the truth no matter how beautiful they may be. However, words can be effective by pointing at what is not true, not who you are. Mathematics and music, art, photography, and film also point and are more open-ended than words, since they do not tell you what truth is. They allow you to interpret through your own feelings. I'm not speaking of emotions, which emanate from the mind of separation, of past memories and hope for futures. I speak of the sense that radiates from the intuitive faculty, the telephone line to the self. It's the instant knowing about something that has no frame of reference, and that feeling nature is where truth is revealed. It is also where untruth is exposed, as you will see. I am that I am. I have found the most effective and simple way to expose what is not true within the false self is to utter the truth of who I am, who you are. This gives attention to the truth, which then expands, as does everything we give our attention to. For me, the easiest way is to say, I am that I am. This simple way of declaring that you are God is an incredibly powerful trigger that opens the vault of hidden conditioning by shedding light on it and exposing it. God is light. Not the light bulb kind of light, although in its capacity as all that is, it's certainly that as well. But here I speak of the radiation that is unseen by the physical eyes. It's a light that is also information. It knows exactly which conditioning gremlin is ready to be exposed. There is no figuring things out as there is in the false self's linear mind world. This is what it means when you hear, you need do nothing. The light of the I am presence is like a precise surgical laser beam that exposes instantly the exact thing to be transformed. Here is where the house of mirrors comes in. Once you've accepted that everything in your world is a mirror for what is hiding the truth of who you really are, you'll recognize the messages and be open to what the self is sending you. When you're consciously involved in self-discovery, 
you will easily become aware of and feel these messages as the next conditioning gremlin to be exposed and have transformed. As I've also said, some mirrors will reveal the incredible beauty of who you really are, and this will become your normal experience more and more as the conditioning gremlins are transformed. But always, once you realize that none of your conditioning defines who you are, you have become the witness in the audience watching the dream in a state of freedom. This is not absolute freedom, because you still have conditioning that's running. But you've distanced yourself far enough away from the dream on the stage to be witnessing it as the self. That's living in the now moment, where the conditioning of your past ceases making a similar future, keeping you in an endless loop of separation and limitation. It ends the suffering associated with pain experienced as a victim. When I first came together with my companion Ingrid, who was a perfectly clear mirror for me, I was literally exposed to a searchlight beamed directly on my conditioning. For me, the first thing to be exposed was my arrogance. You might think that walking down a Florida interstate highway in pitch darkness, with only the shirt on your back and five dollars in your pocket, headed towards my aging parents' home that I swore I would never do, would have brought me fully to my knees in utter humility, and it did. That's when I was ready to move from my knees to my belly. There's an old saying that says, you can't trip when you're on your knees. It doesn't say you can't be kicked over. I had made the no matter what commitment to my freedom, and that meant all bets were off, and that anything goes. The self knows this, and uses absolutely everything possible to bring us out of hundreds, if not thousands of lifetimes of bondage to the tyranny of the false self in our absolute freedom in this one lifetime. It may seem ruthless, but that is often what it takes to break the vice-like grip of the false self. The pathless path. In this new energy, I choose not to speak of a path, as most ancient traditions in the old energy did, because a path suggests time and space, and this defines the illusion of separation and limitation that we're leaving. It places our freedom somewhere out there in the future. As I said earlier, one is one not one plus something else, and one is always now. A typical path seeker will say, I'm here in the material world working towards my freedom. For the false self, this is music to its ears, because it confirms that they have bought into the lie that they are not now free. As long as this concept is given attention, it will stay alive, and their freedom, that is the awareness that they are already free, will elude them. This simple truth is the Alpha and Omega of the new energy. Everything is now. Many people speak of this, but for most, it's an intellectual concept and has not yet actually been felt as real. Actually, everyone has at one time or another experienced losing themselves in something they loved, and in that experience, losing all sense of time and space and identity or personhood. The experience was the now moment where separation, limitation, judgment, and the false self ceased to exist. The difference was that the experience was spontaneous, and after it occurred, it was little more than a momentary phenomena of some interest. Consciously choosing to live this way all the time, from moment to moment, feels similar, but it's experienced consciously. This is the way of manifesting in the new energy, as I will talk about in the next chapter, the simplicity of manifesting in the new energy. All attention on becoming, working toward, practicing to get better at, procedures to get there, and that sort of thing are dropped. Everything speaks of being free now. It matters not that the false self resists or complains or tells you that you're deluding yourself. The false self is the master of delusions. Or that you are arrogant for saying you are free. What you place your attention on expands. In fact, it is arrogant to say that you are not free, since God has said that you are. In Psalms and elsewhere in the Bible it says, know you not that you are gods. These kinds of passages have not been given top billing on the stage of dreams. When you say, I am that I am, you're speaking of a present moment reality, and the God you are recognizes this truth and responds accordingly by showing you how your false self is attempting to block this truth. Everything in the universe now comes to your aid to support the living experience of this truth, despite the false self's protests. You will hear its outraged voice trying every trick it can to persuade you that you're deluding yourself and that it takes years and lifetimes of disciplines and guidance by masters and gurus 
and formulas and endless workshops and books and videos and, and, and. And you will most certainly hear protests from other so-called seekers if you speak openly about being free now. Those who've invested years of dedication to the time-honored ways and means of the old energy have a vested interest in those efforts being justified as correct. Their protests will be loud and clear, but keep your attention on your now moment freedom just the same. It doesn't matter that your false self disagrees. Its distracting noise will fade quickly as you maintain your consistent attention on your now moment freedom. If you pull the plug on a laptop, it'll continue to operate until the reserve power has been depleted. It's the same with your attention. There is an echo from past attention, and the false self uses and your mirrors reflect it, but it's limited and will eventually be heard no more. Even the naysayers that once berated you for your arrogant declaration of freedom will dissolve from your life, as their vibration cannot resonate with the light of truth. They are still God, but sleepers are found in bed, not out in the light plane. Abundant Living I spent 23 years on the so-called path, while at the same time attempting to find freedom in the 3D world through what it calls success, which included wealth, fame, and power. And I know from first-hand experience that having achieved all that it claimed was possible, real freedom cannot be found the way the old energy promotes it. I'm definitely not saying that abundance is in any way a contradiction to truth. In fact, abundance is another name for God, all it is which can lack nothing. It's another way of saying this. To deny abundance, as the patriarchal experience has taught, despite its contradictory promotion of wealth as success, is to express the same arrogance that tells God it is wrong when it says, you are God, you are free, now. Abundance includes all aspects of truth or God, peace, freedom, joy, beauty, love, and much more. The patriarchal description for wealth as success includes none of these. On the one hand, the spiritual aspect of the imbalanced masculine patriarchy has claimed that self-denial and poverty bring you closer to God. The logic was sound because in its essence it was speaking again of attention. Taking attention off the material world made it easier in the slower old energy to keep your focus on God. But this essence was diluted into a judgment against abundant living that survives to this day. Its day is done, though and it's now time to drop this worn-out belief system. All belief systems, in fact. Abundance is who you are, and it is one with freedom. It is the love of, or attachment to, the energy of money and power and fame that blocks the awareness of the pristine beauty, love, and joy that exists within all facets of the God you are. When attachments and expectation of outcomes and all identities other than the one identity that you are God are gone, you are living in the world, not of the world. And that means abundant living. Feeling. When you choose freedom, no matter what, and are open to all the messages the self is sending you through the mirror of your life experiences, the blocks or conditioning to the awareness of who you really are begin to emerge. And along with that conditioning, feelings emerge, painful feelings. These feelings are at first the emotional drama feelings that emanate from the mind and its history of conditioning. And later, once you move through these feelings, you receive the intuitive knowing that feels or just knows the truth. The emotional feelings are connected to your identities, attachments, and expectation outcomes. And as such are feelings about illusions, despite the very realness of them. The intuitive feelings or knowings register the truth and arise after some form of conditioning has been felt. You could say it's the aha after the oh no. I remember reading a post from someone quite well known in the spiritual community that I followed due to their global contribution to working with Gaia's shifting energies. She was experiencing some violence in her part of the world and very honestly expressed her concern. The next day she thanked everyone for reaching out to her but also mentioned some people had said that they felt it strange that she would express fear, being the spiritual world teacher that she was supposed to be. I almost never comment online unless it's a very brief extension of love towards something beautiful, but in this case I was literally compelled to send her support and wrote something about it, how it's natural to experience fear even as a master when you're still living in a body. 
The fear in the master's case is an instinctive reaction, and not the same thing at all as the fear the false self has towards death of its identity. Shortly thereafter I received a reply that shocked me. She was berating me for my comment as if it was an attack on her. I wrote her privately an explanation and said that I had removed the comment so that no one else might misinterpret my support as criticism. For hours after this incident, I felt wretched, not because she had done anything wrong. I was in pain for some other reason that I knew was being triggered by this mirror. All my life I had issues with women, strong women, as you may have gathered at this point in the book. My mother's false self manifested as very childish in its behavior, but when I was a child she was a god for me, as most children see their parents, and this registered as power and strength. She kept me very dependent on her. As a result, I was often sick and even lost a year in school due to ill health. This was combined with the feeling of being unseen and therefore of no value, a conflicting mix of conditionings. Although I had no concept of this until I went deep into self-discovery, every encounter with women throughout my life was an attempt to get my mother to notice me and realize that I loved her so that I would be seen. It mattered not whether the connection was intimate at arm's length or very distant and casual, such as with the woman in this example. The effect of being rejected, especially by a strong woman, for any reason, struck a blow straight to my false self-conditioned feelings, and this was the mirror I was ready to look at, at that time. Although I'd been there several times before during the transformation of my conditioning, it was another and deeper layer that I was ready to feel. It's like driving up the side of a mountain by going around and around, higher and higher. With each revolution, you're able to see things that you've seen before, but from a higher perspective, until you reach the top and everything is visible or transformed. At the beginning, it can feel disappointing to revisit some conditioning you felt you've already had transformed, but in truth, it's always at a higher level, although it may not feel that way at the time. In fact, it's usually more painful because you've gone deeper into the conditioning that's lain hidden for most of your life. During the first few days of feeling wretched, I was able to see as the witness in a state of freedom the way in which women had been powerful mirrors for the underlying cause. This released more feelings and more pain in the form of guilt, shame, and remorse, which are at the root of everyone's basic feeling of unworthiness. Not all mirrored conditions bring up feelings that last that long. Often it may last only a few minutes, hours at most, but this was a primal issue that was entangled with virtually all my conditioning in some way and poisoned my behavior in ways that often seem totally unrelated. It's of great importance to recognize that in order for the transformation of any conditioning to take place, we must first fully feel what comes up when the mirror offers us the opportunity. This is standing in the fire of who you are not. Nothing about your conditioning is who you are. But to transform these blocks, you must first expose what is not real. Triggering Feelings Once you dive into self-discovery or self-inquiry, you will often find yourself asking, what does this or that mean? You could be flipping through a TV guide and are triggered by a movie that will soon be coming up. You don't even need to watch the movie that may be days away from viewing to be aware of the energy radiating from the movie. It could be a sad romance, a thriller with lots of violence, a documentary about war, anything. It's important to not fall into judgment that spiritual people should not be interested in this or that kind of program. All judgments emanate from the false self, including what a spiritual person's behavior should or should not include. If you find yourself asking the question, why am I interested in this movie, then pay attention and be open to the feelings that begin to come up. For a long while, I was drawn to dramas and thrillers where the bad guy gets what's coming to him or her. The popularity of these kinds of movies illustrates the feelings they bring up are very common. If, for example, you're ready to have conditioning related to abuse to be transformed, then this kind of movie may be a trigger for the feelings associated with that conditioning to come up. In the past, like me, you may have watched the movie and received a quick fix and that for a while softened the abuse feelings that were surfacing, and then forgot about it and went about your life without taking the opportunity to go deeper. The self is relentless, however, and as I've said before, will offer you opportunity after opportunity to feel what is ready to be felt and transformed. 
But finally, when you do begin to respond to these triggers, the feelings associated with each opportunity will surface. Simply remain open. The self knows what feelings and how much you're ready for. Just let these feelings flow until they fade, whether it's a few minutes, hours, or much longer. Just stay with it. Saying yes to everything. What you're doing is saying yes to everything that comes up regardless of how much you may believe that this or that feeling is not true. The feeling must be allowed to surface and be fully felt. I remember when Ingrid was guiding me through some conditioning about my parents that had come up and she told me that I was suppressing feelings of rage and hatred towards my parents. I was shocked and I resisted very strongly saying this. I told her that I may be angry at them for what they did to me as a child, but I most definitely don't hate them or feel any rage at all. It doesn't matter if this is true. It matters that the false self believes that it's true, and that's where the conditioning has its origins. And for that conditioning to be exposed, it must be fully felt. Ingrid never paid any attention to what my false self complained about. She knew these feelings were up and running and insisted that I say this. And a quote from Muji that kind of speaks to this, I love you too much to treat you like a person. When you're in satsang, you point to what is false and do not allow anyone to escape the pain of what's coming up. As Ingrid said, I'm not a therapist, but holding satsang so people can discover by themselves who they are, their own freedom or liberation when they're allowed to feel everything in a safe place, where they're just being pointed at the truth without continuing to focus on the identification of a broken and not good enough person. It took some time and many more opportunities over a few years before I really got what she was saying, the depth of its importance. But finally, I had a breakthrough, and the aha moment of recognizing the power of saying yes to everything came upon me. When you say no to any feeling that's ready to surface, you're resisting the self's attempt to free you of some conditioning. And what you resist, which is a form of attention, expands. The feeling may be pressed deeper within and beyond our conscious awareness for the moment, but it has grown and will emerge somewhere else louder and more invasive than the last time as a repeating pattern continues the same suppressed conditioning energy. This is why a gentle message from the self at first may eventually turn into a paralyzing car accident or other life-threatening experience when we do not listen to any of its messages about what is ready to be felt and transformed. The anger and rage and hatred that simmers in the bowels of the false self's unconsciousness is like a volcano and will find an outlet eventually, be it a heart attack, a stroke, cancer, some accident, or some traumatic life-changing experience. In my case, thankfully, I was sitting on the couch looking at Ingrid's resolute stare and finally saying, yes, I do feel these feelings. I do hate my parents, which I finally said, and the power of releasing this twisted, ugly, suppressed feeling welled up inside of me like a flood. It was incredibly painful, and with it came waves of shame and guilt. How could I be such a terrible person? What kind of monster feels this way about their parents? How can I be God when I feel like this? These were some of the things that I put into feelings. The poison just poured out of me more and more. But finally, the flood subsided, and with it, suppressed feelings as well. When this happens, there's a neutral calm or silence that comes over you like you've squeezed every ounce of this conditioning out of its long, hidden vault. It now sits there, exposed and vulnerable. And what you do next is just the opposite of what humanity has done for eons, as it rebelled against every kind of feeling that did not feel cozy and rosy and happy. You embrace what comes up. Everything is God. One is one. There's nothing outside God. Remember I said that God, or you, went into the dream unconscious of who it is. So it could experience, in separation and limitation, the deepest darkness and the highest beauty and truth. It doesn't matter that the dream is an illusion. It matters that it was projected on the screen of consciousness in order for God, you, to experience yourself, totally. And when the conditioning that resulted from your sojourn into darkness is ready to be transformed so that you can again return to full consciousness of yourself as God, embracing everything is the most direct route to your freedom. Embracing or forgiving. 
Embracing everything that comes up is saying yes to the moment, to what is in the moment, to the God that everything is. This is the true meaning of self-love, because it recognizes that you recognize God in and as everything and every experience. In the old energy, a much slower energy, where the false self could not easily be budged from its entrenched position as the dictator of your experience, the concept of forgiveness was effectively used to transform the sickness of body and mind that emanated from the self-hatred that you felt for living as the false self directed you to. Its guidance to look out for yourself in a cruel world of separation and limitation caused you to commit unspeakable horrors upon yourself as humanity. And with that came buried self-hatred conditioning, and later the false concept of sin, and the enormous fear it created for a possible future of a life of eternal damnation. The forgiveness of sins, which transformed self-hatred, initially became an enormous threat to the power the church held over its followers, but over time became one of its own powerful weapons of control. Forgiveness requires that you believe there is something to forgive. This much is obvious. Whether you believe this is sin or simply error, it still requires some sort of transformation. It traditionally meant an intermediary was required who had the power and purity to absolve or release people from their sins. The confessional, by whatever label or belief system, became the platform and ultimately became a sort of bargaining with God farce where people could do almost anything they desired and have the stain removed if they played the games required of them by the church after the fact. A Course in Miracles says God does not forgive because it never condemned. This is truth. God does not condemn itself for playing a tyrant in a dream it created to know itself in a state of unconsciousness of who it is. It does not shoot itself in the foot any more than it condemns itself to some hellish existence somewhere outside the oneness of its love. The whole concept is incredibly ridiculous and yet numberless billions have naively bought into it for many hundreds of years. You may have a very strong vested interest in the concept of forgiveness, and if that feels right for you, then that is your self's guidance at the moment. It is, however, a much slower way than embracing what is. Embracing what is in the moment is loving all that is, another name for the God you are. It does not first label something as bad or wrong, which is the language of separation the false self uses, it simply accepts that everything, no matter how it shows up, is God. Everything, and every circumstance. It recognizes the sleeping beauty God that you, or it, is, who has created much that appears ugly and disgusting, ruthless and cruel, within a dream, but it doesn't condemn itself, or you, for these experiences. This does not in any way mean you accept what is imbalanced or turn your back on it if guided to an opportunity to lift the suffering of the world in some way. It means you embrace it as God without the old judgment-forgiveness two-step. Forgiveness also has a subtle arrogance about it, since it tends to place the forgiver in a position of superiority to the one being forgiven, as if they've arrived at this lofty position of knowing what you've done wrong and chosen to let it go. We're all equal. We're all God. This subtle trap is avoided by simply embracing everything, saying yes to everything that shows up. If you really get this, its enormous power becomes instantly obvious. You still act when you're guided to, to shift circumstances, but you don't buy into or identify with the circumstances as good or bad. Grace transforms. And a quote from Jesus, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Self-love is loving God, and in loving God, grace flows into every situation. I choose to see grace as love in action, the transforming power of love. It's always there since it is also you as God. But without your vulnerable open yes to all that is, it cannot transform what is ready to be transformed. It's as simple as placing a plug in a socket in order to turn on a lamp which then illuminates the darkness and removes the false fears associated with what you believed was there. Summary of Self-Discovery First, make the choice to be free, no matter what. Next, declare who you are as God by saying, I am that I am. Then, stay open and listen 
for the next conditioning that's ready to be transformed. And then you feel fully everything that comes up, all the anger, rage, shame, guilt, remorse, everything, and say yes to all of it. Even the feeling to say no to any of it, say yes to the no as well. Once the feelings subside, embrace everything that came up as aspects of all that is, or God. And finally, after that, grace, or love in action, takes over and transforms the conditioning back into the nothingness from which it came. This is the incredible and lightning fast power of self-discovery that reveals the freedom that you are. When you've gone through this experience fully, just once, it's impossible to ever see or believe that your conditioning defines who you are again. You step off the stage as the puppet of the false self, which is nothing more than conditioning, and into the audience, free as the self observing as a witness the dream movie being enacted. You're still tethered to the false self dreamer, but you're no longer buying into its lies, its definition of who you are, or its control over your experience. This means you are no longer giving it life through your attention. From this vantage point, the blocks to the awareness of who you really are come up very quickly, and the stage player fades into a specter of nothingness, leaving the stage empty, and in that emptiness, the truth pours itself in, and absolute freedom returns. You'll waffle back and forth for a while and go back to identifying with the dreamer, but the more you witness from the audience, the more the play on the stage, the movie, the stories, and the dramas are seen as not you, but your puppet, who has until now been pulling its own strings. There's no more working on yourself and waiting to be free. You are free instantly when you take your witness seat in the audience. From there, you realize that you've always been free. You may call this what you will. There are many, many names for what occurs. I choose to simply call it freedom, where you know that you are God. All doubt-filled intellectual concepts of hope, belief, faith, and trust have faded into knowingness, healing, and wholeness. When our attention has been drawn inward through physical illness or high-stress circumstances, we naturally wish to have these issues healed. Healing the body or distressing circumstances gets our full attention, particularly when it becomes intense or life-threatening, and until we come to the recognition that it is the self speaking to us about our conditioning, healing the outer condition may take our full attention. This is always a temporary solution since the conditioning will find another way to express itself when it's ready to be transformed. Once we take up our position as witness in the audience, free from the suffering of victimhood, all messages, especially the loud ones that manifest as severe physical distress or painful life-changing circumstances, are recognized as the huge blessings that they are. Nevertheless, as the conditioning that brought on these experiences is transformed, we also wish the experience to be transformed. But this is not always the case. There can be a number of reasons for this. I use the metaphor of a laptop with the plug pulled still having residual power in the battery and continuing its programs when the power or attention has been withdrawn. This is often what prolongs a painful experience for a while after the conditioning has been transformed. Depending on how much attention the conditioning received, the painful experience may last for some time after the conditioning is transformed. However, standing in the light of truth or beingness can also be expressed through the example of pain endured with grace. The radiance of grace under extreme circumstances inspires many to go within. Nelson Mandela's long imprisonment and the grace with which he bore the pain and embraced his oppressors during and after it ended touched millions of hearts and helped to drive their attention inward towards personal freedom. Your purpose always includes saying yes to everything, which is the same as embracing all that is or loving yourself, God. Being consciously aware of the God you are is standing in wholeness despite whatever circumstances you may be experiencing. And a quote by Muji. Be grateful for the mind whose role it is to molest the false version of yourself until it becomes unbearable and you're left with no choice but to give up and come home to the heart.